everybody. Uh, thanks for coming out tonight. Um, so we always ask this just to, because we're always interested. How many of you, this is your first whole Portland meeting? Okay, cool. Um, so we go through this every time just because of that. Um, so we're about mobile, obviously. Uh, we meet the fourth Monday of the month. Um, our model, oops, got ahead of myself. We're modeled after an uh, organization called Mobile Monday, um, but we're not actually affiliated with them. Um, the uh, website is mobilepolin.com. Um, we have a uh, mailing list that you can sign up for. It's really just two announcements a month about this meeting, so don't worry about getting a whole bunch of junk for that one. Uh, if you want a whole, you know, more email uh, from people, uh, sign up for the Google group. That's a good place to make announcements about things, try to find work, try to find somebody to do work for you, help with a project, that sort of thing. Uh, we have a Twitter account at uh, Portland. I don't really have any events to speak of at this point, so we're going to go straight to announcements. Um, if you have anything that you would like to talk about that would be of interest to this group, or there's an event, or you have, if you have a job position open, uh, just raise your hand, I'll come around. I just wanted to invite you all to start the weekend. Um, we're looking for developers since uh, there's also there's already a lot of business people, but it's always good to get a lot of developers in there as well. It's really open for any skill levels, so especially you know people that are kind of new to it can come and learn new things. Uh, meet a lot of really cool people. If you have a side project or something you've been working on, you can come and pitch it, or you can just come and work on somebody else's, have fun, eat some good food. On uh, Wednesday, we're going to be having a free party uh, at Green. Uh, Green Dragon and Bistro, there's some cards over here, you can ask me about it later, but it's going to be a good time. Again, like any skill level, so. Hi, I'm here with the uh, Oregon Bioscience Association. I just wanted to uh, let you know about a seminar that we're going to put on uh, in conjunction with Biotronic. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with Biotronic, they're the fourth largest defibrillator pacemaker company. They're located just outside of Portland, their North American headquarters, and we're going to get the head of their embedded systems design person to give a two-hour seminar on the APIs and protocols they use. They actually have mobile applications that have a Bluetooth feed that feeds data directly from the pacemaker defibrillator uh, out. Uh, it also comes with a tour. It's a really rare opportunity to get a tour of a class three implantable medical device. Uh, when I was talking to them last week, uh, one of the reasons they're doing this is because they are trying to expose themselves more broadly to the development community. They estimate 70% of the cost of building their pacemaker uh, or defibrillator or designing it is uh, software. So, uh, and mobile is becoming a much more important part of what they do. So again, uh, we're going to send out a notice to the mailing list. Uh, uh, I'm with OregonBio.org, so it's pretty easy to get to our site, um, and we'll send stuff out through the network. But uh, again, this is the first time they've ever opened up their plant to this kind of a tour. Uh, I've taken it once since I've been in uh, my position for three years. It is maybe the best technology tour in Oregon. So uh, it's almost a totally automated production environment, quality control environment. So. They can learn a lot of cool great stuff. Thanks. Hello, uh, my name is Chris. I just started UIPDX, which is catering to the design side of mobile, uh, myself and a few others. And if you're interested or you're of other designers, we're trying to build a directory. It's uipdx.com. Um, we haven't an event scheduled yet. We're just trying to build our Okay, um, so thank you to our sponsors, Urban Airship for the Room, Cloud4 for the food and drinks, uh, and Sprint. Um, first, I think Jason wants to say something, so. Uh, Hello. For those of you who have been here in the past, uh, you may have noticed the absence of a keg. Uh, <laughs> and uh, sorry about that. Um, some things are changing in terms of the uh, 
the hosting situation here in terms of what um, uh, urban airship can provide and sort of like Festus's um, controls on the space and liability and all that sort of stuff. So we're sorting that out, um, but we found out about it a little bit late and could not uh, make other plans. So, uh, you know, there are lots of bars nearby. So <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe afterwards, uh, but you know, there is some food and other drinks and um, yeah. Uh, we're, we're still trying to figure out what that's going to look like in the future. We would like to continue to provide uh, some, some beverages um, during the events. Um, and we will! They just may be sodas. Um, <laughs> but hopefully the beer will return. That's it. Right, so, and now uh, Greg Cochran from Techstars is going to talk about the uh, spring story. Okay. Thanks. Hey everybody, how's it going? I'm Greg with Techstars. Um, it's awesome to be here tonight. I really appreciate you guys coming out. And uh, so I helped run the Nike Plus Accelerator. You guys familiar with that? Here in Portland with Nike and the Fuel Band. And we're really excited. Um, we're actually launching the Sprint Accelerator. And we'll pass out some cards here in a minute about the program. But we're looking to connect with really awesome mobile teams and talk about mobile health. And there is some amazing stuff going on in Kansas City besides the barbecue. <laughs> which is epic, by the way, if you haven't been there. But uh, absolutely awesome stuff going on in the mobile space out in KC. And I wanted to just tell you a couple minutes about the program and what we're looking to do. I'm really excited to share with you. But first, I thought I'd tell you a little bit more about uh, KC and their entrepreneurial ecosystem. Perspective, I think, is literally uh, our smartphones are going to be our next healthcare delivery devices. So, this is just a great opportunity for Kansas City to be in this space. Because we are really focused on it right now, people who are entrepreneurial in spirit know that this is one place where you want it. And it's always nice to go where you want it. And we want you here. You can feel the energy, you can feel the passion, and it's just being translated into this intense momentum. And can't wait to see where we 
are 18 months from now. I think on many, many levels, the accelerator is a great addition to an already growing ecosystem. It's just kind of a new day for entrepreneurial initiatives, no matter where, which side of the equation you're on. So if you want to be one of those high quality, high growth startups, this is the program for you. So we are actively looking for fantastic global companies in this space. If you know some, we'd love to connect. We're gonna pass out some cards. Uh, but really quick, we're gonna select 10 companies for this accelerator program. It will be a standard Techstars program, and it will be partnership with Sprint. Uh, it's gonna be for three months, and we're gonna give each team up to $120,000 in funding. And, you know, why mobile health, right? Lots of statistics, everybody's talking about health. This is a very hot space. We're in a few moments ago about it. Uh, just some, some awesome stats that are out there, but we're really you know, looking for disruptive companies. Um, and it could be everything from mobile, it could be something to do with big data, it can be you know, a platform, but uh, it just depends on what it is, but we're looking for great teams. And you know, by the way, if you don't know a lot about Kansas City, really amazing. Uh, Cerner is there, they're one of the world's largest health IT companies and health hospitals. Uh, obviously Sprint, that is where their headquarters and they have a ton of life science out there as well. Sprint right now is building out one of the most amazing accelerator spaces that I have personally ever seen. It is fantastic and uh, this thing is tricked out from top to bottom in the Crossroads District, in the middle of downtown Kansas City and it's going to be awesome. And again, we're looking for people solving big problems in the health industry and we appreciate you uh, hearing about this tonight and again, we're going to pass out cards. We'd love to connect with you if that's you, one of your teams, or somebody that you know. And uh, the applications close in early January. The program starts in March of 2014. And you can learn more at SprintAccelerator.com. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Gary. And I, actually, out of uh, habit, I credited Cloud4 for the food and drinks. And actually, uh, I should thank uh, Sprint for that this month. <laughs> well, thank you. So this month, we're going to talk about Bitcoin. Um, if you read Tech Press at all, um, you're probably sick of hearing about Bitcoin, but you still probably don't have any idea what anybody's talking about. You hear about Satoshi Nakamoto and uh, blockchain and cryptocurrency and all these kind of terms that nobody seems to really explain. So, uh, Rob Benigali, who is the co-founder and CEO of Lyft, which was the uh, first native uh, uh, Bitcoin wallet for iOS, is here to demystify this for us. So, let's hear for him. Thank you. My mic's on. Hello. Okay, good. Cool. Well, uh, thank you all for coming. I want to thank you, uh, thanking, uh, Jason and Matt for putting this together and also just talk about my experience with mobile portal. I actually remember. Uh, one panel that back in January 2010, where James Keller from Small Society, you guys know Small Society here in town, was speaking. Anybody at that, at that mobile portal meeting? One person? Two cool people. So that was a long time ago. We were talking about, whoa, what could the iPad do? It's like, it was one month old back then. Uh, it was a really exciting time. Uh, but it's been only like three years, and uh, mobile has changed so much. So it's exciting to um, see this group still together. My friend Matt back there, I met with the mailing list here, so if you're New to Mobile Portland, I encourage you to use the list and uh, use it to reach out and meet new people. And if you're getting into mobile, it's a terrific way to do it. So help me out. I also wanted to acknowledge uh, the Bitcoin Meetup group. Anybody from the Bitcoin Meetup group uh, end up showing up? So we have a couple people here. So thanks for coming. Uh, they're not. These are people who are actually enthusiasts of Bitcoin who uh, are coming to hear it from a new technology perspective. So thanks also for coming out. I wanted to here. Am I cutting in and out a little bit? Yes. Yeah. Is that totally distracting or what? Yes. Let's try this. Let's try talking really loudly.
Check one, two, one, two. Ah, put it in my mouth. Then I'll... Okay, we'll try this. Silent, no. Hello. Check. What about in your shirt pocket or something? Is it that? No, all the mics do it. Hello? Okay, so that's the P. If he just goes without the Yeah, yeah, it's good. It's going to be okay? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, that's better. Yeah,
talk a little bit more about Coinbase uh, later. Uh, and also blockchain. Blockchain is another web wallet. It's uh, larger internationally, and it's more popular with people who are kind of like more on the cryptocurrency underground cool level. So if you're like more of like a Bitcoin enthusiast, you might choose blockchain for security reasons or uh, just personal reasons that you don't like the more commercial version, uh, which is Coinbase. I put BIPs up here also. They're not really known for their wallet, but they are the largest wallet in Europe right now. And they are known mostly for their merchant services. So let's say you've got an e-commerce website uh, and you want to start taking Bitcoin. You can go to BIPS, get an account there, and they've got a lot of integrations that will allow you to quickly hook up, uh, what is that, uh, Magento, uh, to Bitcoin pretty quickly, and uh, then they'll deposit it in your web wallet uh, right there. Uh, the, to speak to the clients, the ones that run on your computer, the ones that Miranda had running, there's two really kind of more popular ones, Bitcoin QT and Armory. New people to Bitcoin don't usually use these. Most people who are new to Bitcoin are starting with there. And the comparison I use on this would be, you know how I mean, we all used to have Outlook or like a new door running on our machines? Uh, well, then we transitioned to Gmail and like cloud-hosted email providers that many people have. Uh, kind of, this is your kind of your Outlook, Eudora kind of thing, and those are your cloud ones. And some of the benefits of a cloud wallet, Bitcoin wallet, uh, are similar to those that you see in a cloud-based email solution. So for example, uh, let's say that you wanted to uh, run some kind of plugin or access your Gmail, for example, from your phone. It's probably most of people need to do. Uh, that's not a problem. It's really easy to do. But if you're storing, if you're downloading your email and you're storing it in Outlook or Eudora, your phone doesn't really necessarily easily talk to your computer and then go in and talk to you. Eudora is just kind of a pain. So from a mobile perspective, the cloud solutions for walls are easier to access and just more flexible. So that's kind of what a way to think about the walls that exist right now and how you can send and receive Bitcoin if you're Miranda or someone else. Can I add one more thing to that? Yeah. Uh, on the non-cloud hosted services, you actually maintain private keys of your Bitcoins as opposed to being in a cloud service where you don't actually hold that. So if Coinbase or blockchain were to be compromised, you would not have control of those coins anymore versus when you store them on your computer that you store or out of format. No matter what service is compromised, one computer in front of the network, you have your points. That's a really good point. That's something that I'll probably try to speak to you a little bit more in the risk section. But, uh, we're talking about money here, uh, real dollars. So we're not carrying a lot of Bitcoin, for example. If you have a ton of Bitcoin, there are this client in particular is specifically suited for helping ensure that it doesn't disappear or get hacked. So uh, that's, a, that's a really good point. Thanks for that. So um, how is Bitcoin being used? This is kind of a fun slide. Uh, not very much. It's <laughs> probably the way I should begin. Bitcoin is probably really one point. Bitcoin is so early. I, I remember talking to Jason about this. He says, ah, I, don't, I don't know about the Bitcoin. <laughs> Dang, a little bit skeptical. I think he tweeted something. I was like, I'm, I'm still skeptical. You can't think that. <laughs> oh, I'm still skeptical. So there's a lot of skepticism around Bitcoin, and that's, that's reasonable. It's a new technology. There was a lot of skepticism about the internet. <laughs> so, uh, so the, uh, there is, it's still early. It's been four years in now, uh, but it's really only gotten interesting fairly recently. So, how is it being used? It's being used to pay for things online. So, these are services that take it Reddit, uh, OkCupid, you can buy memberships and subscriptions using Bitcoin from them. Uh, also, there's a bunch of online, uh, online e commerce shops that accept Bitcoin for payment. Memory Dealers is a hardware you can buy routers and RAM and all kinds of hardware off that. That's actually run by the famous Bitcoin guy, Roger Bear. There's a, a ton of different uh, uh, e-commerce shops already that are accepting Bitcoin. So that's one thing you can use Bitcoin for. Uh, you can use it to pay other people. So I don't know, anybody ever paid another person with Bitcoin in here? Boom, boom. Okay, I mean back, there's a couple people. So you might go, okay, yeah, there's a couple of freaks at Noble Portland. Right? <laughs> and, uh, Bitcoin. But I assure you that there are other freaks out there too. So I took a screenshot uh, this afternoon of the Portland Craigslist. I searched for Bitcoin and then I got rid of some mining keywords because people saw a lot of mining equipment. I didn't go over that. But mining is an important component of Bitcoin. And uh, these are some of the items that you can currently buy on Craigslist in Portland using Bitcoin. So you can see the top one's a wheel lock. There's some auto, auto car I'm not familiar with. You can get a modem, uh, Motorola, and there's a printer, and there's even a utility trader. 
You buy an I, 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 £870 capacity utility trailer or a monitor with Bitcoin, but I like the second one, it's more interesting, it's interesting to me, which is you can buy a <laughs> Halloween costume for $50. And you can see that this is kind of, they kind of explain it like they would a normal ad, it's pretty typical. <laughs> and, you know, maybe something else. And then, at the bit of it, I'll accept cash or Bitcoin. I'll accept cash or Bitcoin. And that's kind of like thing that you'll see, is this, as it becomes something that's more adapt, um, adopted, people are more welcome to take the currency in lieu of uh, US dollars or uh, pounds or euros. That, um, so people will be saying, I'll take, I'll take Bitcoin. Uh, paying things for brick and mortar. This is an emerging thing. So there aren't that many places in Portland that accept uh, Bitcoin uh, at this time. But I know one of them. Does anybody know Whippy's Pies in the uh, food carts over in the southeast? So Whippy's, you can go buy Whippy's Pie right now. Bitcoin, which is pretty cool, I think. But uh, there, anybody who has an open shop, you guys have a retail solution. Uh, this is the, the biggest player right now in turning a brick and mortar into a Bitcoin accepted uh, place you can accept Bitcoin. Uh, BitPay basically integrates with existing point of sale terminal systems and allows when somebody walks up to your counter to scan a QR code on the fly and basically pay for a good uh, or service right there and actually integrates and the receipt comes out and everything. Uh, this is this is new stuff. They just I think they took money this year uh, and so this is like happening right now. So this is really early still, but uh, there's a bunch of places up in Seattle. Uh, there's a place in uh, the Valley. I think they also index this. So if you have a brick and mortar or you know somebody who does and you want to upgrade them to use Bitcoin, that would be a good check out. Uh, this is probably the biggest use of Bitcoin right now, which is as a value store. People aren't even buying it necessarily to use it. They're using buying it because it's going up in value and they think that it's going to be worth more than it is today. And uh, you might think they would be crazy, but then I put it in, I just did this graph this afternoon. This is the most recent graph of the price of Bitcoin from the Bitstamp exchange, which is Kind of the gold stick, the Bitcoin standard, I guess. Now for pricing, and you can see, like, if you had bought Bitcoin a year ago, you would bought it for about fifteen dollars, and then we saw this crazy run up in uh, April when it hit two hundred sixty-six, and then dropped off a cliff, uh, and that yeah, upset some people. <laughs> but uh, then, it, you know, it's kind of like meandered along, and then in the last two weeks, three weeks, it jumped back up, and it's been uh, topping up around two hundred, and that's just nuts. That's just a that's just an incredible amount, and that's why people are often buying Bitcoin and holding it right now. They're not quite ready to use it, they want to uh, see if that's going to become more. On the other hand, if you are a believer, and I'd say that's kind of what it's like to be a Bitcoin person at this point, because you kind of sound like a nut, uh, is that you don't really care necessarily that it's going to go up or down, and you don't mind sharing it and spending with other people because uh, you want the currency to succeed. I, I told this, I was talking to this this person uh, the other day, I was almost compared to like driving a Prius, you know? <laughs> you, you just kind of want this thing to happen and you want to be kind of doing this different thing. Bitcoin is not involved with the banks. There's a lot of libertarian reasons to want to use Bitcoin as well, which you can look into. But uh, a lot of people I think about Bitcoin uh, are buying Bitcoin to hold on to it. That's the idea that people will appreciate it. So, to jump right in, buying and selling Bitcoin. So if you wanted to buy Bitcoin today, one way to do that would be through online exchanges, and these are two of them. I mentioned Coinbase already, and Bitstamp has the, the graph right now. But if you wanted to go and uh, buy some Bitcoin, you could do it. You just either need a bank account, a U.S. bank account largely, uh, for these two at least. And you can do a thing called an ACH transfer. They take wire transfers in. Um, that's how a lot of people are doing it largely. You can't really buy it with a credit card or you're going to get scammed because when you send Bitcoin uh, to somebody, it's permanent and then somebody can charge back the credit card. So there's actually a fair amount of scams uh, going on still in Bitcoin. So you kind of got to be careful with how you buy it. But there are some pretty safe places. These are, these are pretty good uh, places to start. Another example is Global Bitcoins. So this is a site that kind of matches you up with people who are in your neighborhood or your city and they'll literally meet you at a Starbucks or a Dumptown, rather, uh, to sell you Bitcoin. But then also, people here in this audience, so is anybody in this audience willing to sell Bitcoin for cash tonight? Gamble's also. Gamble's also. Over here. So, there's two, two. So, it's one, 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 two, one. That's a lot of Bitcoin here. It's a bunch of Bitcoin. So, um, it's amazing. Anybody want to buy Bitcoin for cash? So, maybe you should try that. So, there's one person back there. So, you all should find each other afterwards to buy and sell some Bitcoin. 
It's pretty easy to do, and it's also easy to be done with mobile, which we're going to get into in a second. So why would you, I'm going to start talking into more, I'm going to transition from what Bitcoin is, how it's used, and all that stuff, and get into how you integrate this into software, uh, how you think about this from a mobile product perspective, and kind of what the potential point is now. Um, just out of curiosity, how many more developers in this audience? Is so, fair enough. Okay, so uh, we'll talk a little bit about this. So why would you integrate Bitcoin into your software, mobile or otherwise? Number one thing, I think a lot of people are excited about is no fees. So we're very, very low fees, uh, is what I should say, if, if, if at all. Uh, you can, uh, often when you're processing transactions with credit cards, you're going to see 1 to 4% uh, charges. You're also having to deal with signing up with those services. You're dealing with chargebacks, so you sell a product, a software product, and then they dispute that charge, and then you don't get the money, and you get out the software. Kind of a bummer. There's a lot of downsides to dealing with credit cards, which I imagine if you've dealt, dealt with it a fair amount, you would know some of those problems. A lot of them don't exist with Bitcoin, you just have to do problems, but uh, they don't exist there. That's a kind of a cool aspect. Another one is this is, a, I think, a soft point, but truly there's a marketing opportunity for being able to say, uh, We work with Bitcoin right now. Uh, our software uh, now incorporates Bitcoin for payments on some particular thing you sell or uh, you've integrated Bitcoin in some way. There's a lot of, like I said, these kind of people, these believers are really uh, beating the drum and, and getting the word out about people who are incrementally building the ecosystem. So that's uh, an opportunity. Uh, you have the opportunity to have this uh, Bitcoin increase in value after you've held it. So let's say that your software, uh, you, know, you have regular revenue that you're seeing from your software and you will take a portion of it in Bitcoin, and you don't need that cash right away, you just let it sit. I mean, I can go back to that graph, but if you also become uh, a believer in Bitcoin and you believe it's going to go up, you can potentially see greater value than I actually had a friend who paid someone back for a ticket at a party that he went to the other night at, when it was 183. And then later in the day, it was about $200. So the ticket ended up being worth more for the person who sold it. So that's possible. Um, you're promoting the use of a global currency. So if you, um, in the United States, we don't really worry too much about our dollar just kind of evaporating value. But if you live in Argentina, you would know that in the last 30, you know, 30 35 years, their currency's dropped for like to almost zero or zero three times. So you can imagine having your entire life savings go and earn go to nothing. Uh, you would uh, probably think more deeply about a currency that is not being controlled by the government. And um, so you're essentially promoting the use of something that uh, is potentially transformative for the entire planet from a financial perspective. Uh, there's no government involved in regulation, there's no banks involved in regulation. So if you have kind of that ethos, you're interested in that ethos, that might be a reason, reason or a to try it out. And then making money. So um, there's actually uh, really an emerging opportunity for making money by integrating Bitcoin. I'm going to cover that in a little bit. I've got one slide here on why Bitcoin is mobile. So there's well, everybody's using smartphones now. We're seeing uh, you know, we're seeing PCs are just tanking so hard for PCs right now. Uh, people are simply moving their online activities to mobile devices. Uh, I almost don't even feel like there's almost a need to say why Bitcoin and mobile are in length because almost all software that's being developed is uh, you need to be looking seriously at mobile as your platform. So obviously if you're developing new software technology, you should probably be looking at mobile first or at least mobile high up on your list. But also there's an increasing number of transactions that are occurring on the go as people are moving around. And I took these little screenshots from the App Store from the work category. They have these, and one the reason I put them here is if you go to the App Store yourself uh, or Google Play, and you, uh, you search and you look at these apps, and you think, okay, of all each of these apps, how could I, how could Bitcoin be involved in any one of them? Um, it's kind of, I think, a good mental exercise to see, like, to get a picture of uh, applications that have Bitcoin that they integrated into them. I think that would be a good exercise. integrating it 
you often need your user skill assigned in. That's kind of automated now, I think, with iOS, but you'll need to kind of provide something like that. You need to be able to list the friends the person has on Facebook. You need to be able to send messages sometimes. These are kind of typical things that you might do in your app that you've written uh, when you do a Facebook integration. So the reason I list these things out is I wanted to talk about uh, a cloud-hosted Bitcoin wallet. So <laughs> I had those uh, Coinbase and Bitcoin <coughs> and Bips up there. And each of them have an API, which I'm going to talk about in a second. And these are the kind of common things you might want to do with your mobile application uh, with one of these wallets. So you want to be able to have the user log in to their wallet, because you, know, uh, you don't necessarily want to have your own wallet. Uh, you want them to use Coinbase or leverage the existing users that are on these, these systems. You need to get the balance for them so you can not try to send more than they have or need to display that. And you want to be able to send or receive the so these are kind of common things. So you kind of see how there's similar functional things you're going to do between these different things and how you can kind of think about them similarly. That's kind of should demystify a little bit of how you would potentially start using Bitcoin in your software. How do you go with Bitcoin part two? So this is probably impossible to do. So I'll just explain what it's all here. This is a, a if you go to blockchain.info, that's this, this site, or you go to coinbase.com, uh, and you go and click on their docs or their developer link, you'll find a series of docs very similar to what you see on almost any other cloud hosted uh, service. And it's a RESTful service. It's got, uh, you, can, you can't really read it too well, but there's this one long URL. And this is a way to send Bitcoin. It's got really specific variables here the amount, the, uh, who it's coming from, who it's going to, you pass these things as variables in. Uh, once you've uh, authenticated, you know, before you execute this, you can jump. I think these are all OAuth 2 authentications. Uh, you can just go ahead and start sending and receiving money. And I think that this, it's really cool about this is, you know, you're not, that you're subverting having to deal with any kind of existing payment, like Visa, MasterCard, even the um, way that you need simple by some other startups out there, you just can avoid dealing with that. You're just moving money. You're like a bank. So it's pretty, pretty powerful. You can reach in and start moving money directly across the cross and between accounts. Uh, I wanted to show my next slide is on recent changes, but before that, I thought we could talk about an example. So I can't give you the solution for what your Bitcoin app should be that's going to make you, you know, a Bitcoin billionaire. But we can do a thought exercise together on some ideas <coughs> for like what kind of app is. <coughs> And I have one here. It kind of goes after the current, you kind of have this arc of what Bitcoin is doing right now. So people are really in a value store. Like people who want to make money on Bitcoin by buying and selling. So this example I put together here is, they, I, want to, I want to day trade Bitcoin. While I'm sitting at my desk and I'm supposed to be working, I want to buy and sell a Bitcoin app and I'm going to make a zillion dollars doing that. And now that, that may seem like a hard thing to do, but I'll tell you right now, actually, it's very hard to do. But uh, a lot of people probably think they so you could probably build an app, $2.99 or something, and throw this app in the store, and all it would do would say, uh, it would, you'd set a price point. If this if Bitcoin hits uh, $170, goes down to $170, send me a push notification and allow me to immediately sell for my Coinbase. And there's uh, the commands at the API level Coinbase, uh, the technology for push, all this is available to you. Probably the people in this room could write an app like that in their sleep. Uh, and I think this would be an app actually people would buy right now. If you build something like this, and similarly, you can have something that would remind you to buy, or that would be, that's it, sell at 170, buy at 170, sell at 230 or something, something that would allow you to do that. So this seems like a pretty simple example, but it actually leverages all the concepts of mobile uh, development that you probably are familiar with already, and it's uh, an integration with Bitcoin, so it's kind of a cool example. Uh, I have another example that highlights some of our work. This is actually not a pretend one. This is actually a problem that we tackled. It was, I can't easily send friends Bitcoin. And I didn't show this, but sending Bitcoin today can be kind of a bummer. You kind of need to know this long wallet address. Uh, some services have built some things to make it easier. But what we did was go, hey, it's really hard to send Bitcoin, and we've got the system for sending, Bitcoin, uh, sending messages already. Let's just make it really easy to send Bitcoin back. So we basically um, connected uh, each of our users that are already friends with each other to send messages. 
we have them connect to their phone call, and then we automate the sending and receiving of Bitcoin between them. And that can be done with any social application. So if you have a social application, um, you want to be able to have people send Bitcoin, you can have each user authenticate to the wallet and help them send Bitcoin back and forth. You can, there's a startup in the class that I'm looking at. We were in Accelerator this summer. There's a startup that was doing uh, skill-based gaming. So let's say you're playing uh, NBA Jam against each other, or Mortal Kombat, or I guess uh, Donkey Kong against the NBA. And, uh, and uh, you want to bet on the game. So you, you before the game begins, you say, we're going to bet half a Bitcoin, a hundred bucks. Uh, half a Bitcoin on the outcome. And then to build the software right, you can actually make it so that at the end of the game, you can hack a bomb to do this right now. You can make it so at the end of the game, uh, the other person gets paid uh, Bitcoin no matter what, if they've got a higher, uh, a higher score. So, so basically a range of different integrations. Probably the key to come back to is thinking about these few things. Uh, having, the, having a user sign into a cloud hosted wallet, being able to view the balance and then moving that Bitcoin around. You can wrap your head around these as your basic mechanisms for Bitcoin and software. Then you can probably do some pretty cool stuff. And if you have projects, many people in here have already built software, or already have long-running projects. And if you can start by thinking, knowing you can do this, knowing that there's commands, you can actually go out and run, and it will let you start doing it right away. That should help spark some creativity in how you can make Bitcoin a part of and you build what you want. So, some recent changes. Uh, so this is kind of cool. Coinbase just began last week offering up to $5 in Bitcoin for each uh, referral that activates. So I'll explain that briefly. Uh, let's say, for example, that you have a, an app that uses Bitcoin. And uh, let's do the uh, day trading app that we talked about at the end of the day. So we've got this app, and you sell it for $2.99. And the person has never used Bitcoin before. Uh, so they download your app for and they realize they need to get a wallet. They haven't even created it. So uh, your app actually allows them to create a Coinbase wallet. Well, it's great for Coinbase if they end up going and buying Bitcoin from Coinbase. So what happens is uh, Coinbase will take 1% of the transaction fee uh, when somebody buys Bitcoin. And if your app was the source of the creation of that wallet, you're going to see a $5, $5 Bitcoin payday each time that happens. So one way to think about this is you build this app for $2.99, so you're already making two bucks each sale, and then about one out, of, one out of some unknown number, which I don't, I don't know, but a solid number activates by buying Bitcoin after creating the wallet using your app, you're going to see a second pay. Uh, it's a one time, it's not recurring, but you're going to see a second pay uh, for each of those. So just building apps that leverage Bitcoin uh, for some of these wallet providers can be uh, valuable. It's kind of cool. And this is brand new, so you're not, oops, you're not past the, you haven't missed the market. Other one, uh, this happened today, this is really cool, blockchain.info, just today allowed, uh, changed their API to allow you to create a wallet. So uh, previously you could only attach existing wallets to their service, now you can create them too. Now they have not yet started offering that $5 refer referral fee, because they actually don't sell Bitcoin uh, right now. But they do have other services that they charge for, and I would guess, my guess would be that following this announcement would be a similar referral program because they're going to need to compete with what Coinbase is offering. So you could theoretically you know, go back to that example here and give them an option to create a wallet on Coinbase or blockchain. And then you could go after Coinbase blockchain and be like, hey, I'm selling a thousand copies of this app a day. And I'm, I'm making 300 wallets minimum a day. What are you going to pay me in addition to, to say to the user that you use this one? And that's, kind of, that's how early on it is right now. I mean, it's, it's like, uh, you know, uh, there will be blood. <laughs> you know that there's, there's a movie about this oil man, and at the very beginning of the movie, uh, he's actually out mining. He's like gold mining. You guys remember this? And, and as he's out in the middle of the desert, and he's, he's still he's down the shaft, and, this, and he's down there getting gold out, and he gets to the top of the shaft, climbs out, and throws some dynamite down there, and then he blows himself up basically, and then he falls down his mine and breaks his leg. And I say like. Uh, that's kind of the state of where Bitcoin is right now. <laughs> it's so early on, it's just so early that uh, things are being built, companies are actually growing very fast, some are being acquired, uh, 
things are happening very quickly. People we'll call it Bitcoin speed, is what is happening right now in uh, Bitcoin technology. So if you'd like to move fast, if you're mobile already, this is definitely a fun market to play in. This stuff is, is changing. Those are the kind of the two <coughs> most recent things I can think of that would be most relevant to this talk. Risks and considerations, of which there are many, and I gloss all over all of them. Uh, I'll begin with uh, Android versus iOS. You're probably already familiar that Google Play is much more accepting of apps that are added to the store uh, in the sense that you basically have anything. Uh, which is kind of cool, especially for Bitcoin, because it meant that Android was the early lead in uh, cool Bitcoin apps, because you could get them in there. Apple uh, was very hesitant uh, with Bitcoin apps. Uh, they had a lot of apps that would let you view your balance, you charged, really boring stuff, I thought, uh, that were in the store, and they had largely rejected apps that wanted to actually move Bitcoin around. And that really changed. I think that uh, uh, Matt mentioned that with ours, actually, we were among the very first to get uh, sent. We, well, we actually don't have a wallet, so I'm going to clarify that. We, have, we connect up to those services, like I described. And we allowed you to move Bitcoin back and forth. So we were among the first to allow you to send Bitcoin back and forth. People were asking, like, hey, how did you get past the sensors at Apple to do it? I said, magic. The reason I said that was that I had no idea why Apple decided to let her ask you. Uh, but uh, I can tell you now, I think there are a couple of things. One, Apple was kind of hesitant anyway. They definitely were rejected. They rejected Coinbase's app. So the biggest company that actually rejected their app. Um, I think they've changed a little bit. I think they're really big on user interfaces. So they do a great job with building an application that's beautiful, leverages. They're more likely to improve. Uh, and I think also since the, our company is really tiny compared to Coinbase, which is massively growing and kind of like a hot electric, they're getting uh, subpoenaed by, uh, by Congress, I believe, uh, that you know, maybe they're too hot to touch that. But since then, literally that's probably an update, is last week a Coinbase staff got into the store and also another wall uh, app got into the store last week. So like I said, things are happening right now in mobile or Bitcoin. So I would say that the Google Play, Android App Store, if you just want to get an app in and you want to deal with the risk of being approved, just Google Play. There's two platforms. But uh, Apple App Store is now getting more likely to accept apps. So that's a regulatory concern. <laughs> Actually, uh, this is sort of a really big deal, right? I mean, nobody wants to go to jail or get fined or anything like that. Uh, was shot, yeah, over doing something wrong. So um, I actually pitched a lot of this, this talk around the idea of implementing these wallet providers in the cloud instead of creating your own wallet. And uh, part of the reason I suggest that is we're essentially leaving the risk at the floor of the wallet provider. When you're operating via the API. Uh, you're at least not directly handling the Bitcoin, you're not buying and selling Bitcoin directly. So uh, there's some insulation there, but I am not a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> so take that for what it's worth. And also, uh, uh, so that's a, that's a big issue. When it comes down to it, Bitcoin is completely unregulated. There's not been any legislation specifically around uh, its purchase or sale. There's really limited, I should say, limited uh, opinion on it uh, from FinCEN. Uh, and you can do your own homework on that. That's a lot of people feel like they, yeah, people won't understand long enough to figure it out. But I, there are a lot of good reasons for them to figure out specifically with regard to taxes. So I would guess, especially the sale of Bitcoin from US based companies. So I would suspect they will be coming out right with the right thing. So there is some risk. You spend six months on an app and then somehow it's not allowed in the US. But again, remember we're working with the global currency. So it's possible that even after we develop uh, here in the United States, that for some reason, and I don't think this is going to happen, for some reason it wasn't allowed anymore here, you still be able to sell them all the markets. So that's, that's a problem. I think that's it. I, had a, I was going to offer you a demo if you wanted to see how Blip work and everything like that. Other than that, I really wanted to just open it up and do Q&A and just say what's up. Thank you, everyone. I uh, still want to go with the mic if we can, just so that we can hear with the camera. So um, if you have a question, just uh, raise your hand on the room. Uh, all of your information.
questions for them today. How do you know about what's happening today as far as like the Bitcoin thing? And where are you track? How are you able to stay up to date with this stuff since the changes so quickly? Good question. So you think how, how do you stay up to date on what's going on with Bitcoin, specifically from a technology and innovation perspective? Um, one is obsessive. <laughs> <laughs> like talk to your friends and you're on. Uh, almost like, you know, say every time music, I feel like we kind of got to run out and go out and get it. It's, it's, the mainstream press coverage isn't very elaborate, I don't think. But um, the place I go to often is our Bitcoin on Reddit. So that's every 24 hours, it's like new top stories. You can, can't miss uh, something new and interesting here. I don't think it goes into here. Uh, the Bitcoin talk forums, so there's a particular forum on Bitcoin talk, uh, they have the news and press releases uh, forum, sub forum. Basically, anything that happens is kind of important enough that it got into the news. It's categorically indexed for the day. And then Twitter is pretty awesome. There's a couple of particular Bitcoin um, maniacs out there. You can probably find them pretty quickly. They tweet constantly about what's going on. Um, and I'd say build it. You know? Build, get PHP or whatever, some quick prototyping language out, and just start trying to throw down some Bitcoin stuff, and you won't stop from learning. Hey Rob, great talk. Uh, so, are you have you drank the Kool Aid? Is that what you're saying here? <laughs> uh, and so, if if you are a believer, like what what is the what is your faith? Like what is like what is it about Bitcoin that has you so excited? Because you you talked a lot about just generalities. Like why are you why what made you drink the Kool Aid? Why? Well, not only about Bitcoin chasing. Okay. It's more about, and that's what I think anybody who's really deeply into this stuff would say. It's not actually about Bitcoin. So really, this slide is incorrectly titled. It should say opportunities in virtual currencies. That would be a more uh, uh, longer term. My lecture would last more years than this probably if I said that. Or cryptocurrencies. Because Bitcoin is really uh, a, an example of the first uh, really well adopted Virtual currency, and the the idea is is that you know we've had a lot of success so far in our country with the dollar, and you know there's been I guess some people would say limited success with the euro, uh, but that uh, these are not necessarily the final answer for how we communicate value. And you might I mean this is this is the, the crazy hard part I think is imagining a world that doesn't exist. I mean, there's no real example of this world yet, and like the internet I think is a perfect example. Go back to like 1994 or something, you know, when we were like dialing up with a like trumpet uh, to get online and you're sending email with each other. Uh, and you're configuring like all these ridiculous settings in order to do so. Uh, and you're like explaining to your friend, like, the internet is awesome, like, you just have to do all this crap, and then you're, there's no one to email, and there's no websites, and there's no Twitter or Facebook or anything that makes sense to the internet. Uh, I think that uh, Bitcoin and virtual currencies are in a similar position, right? <laughs> Kind of the of to use. There's not any obvious okay Cupid. Like, really, that's the cool online thing. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think there's some level of faith in that. Um, this is the very early. And there's a lot of promise in the technology. You couldn't have said in '94, oh yeah, there's going to be Osama bin Laden raising we did live, you know, on the internet in the future. We're going to we're going to have like a countries, governments all based on the internet. You know, it's not going to be just this trumpet. You know. Go for things. So what is so so I, I get that there's something out there. Like what is that thing, right? Like what is it that you like are you are you looking for disruption? Like are you looking at this as revolutionary? Like you want to disrupt governments being attached to money? Like are you are you anti Fed? Like, <laughs> like I, I mean I, like where where does that sort of believer and you know, if that's the case, like you know, we've got uh, Keynesian economics and we've got all these Mechanisms by which we've been able to adjust economic and sort of like handle dips in the economy. Like, are you trying to? Is your belief that we need to get past that to a different future where that's not the case? That's a that's a tough question to answer for the crowd. I think <laughs> <laughs> you're not on film. We're just it's no, 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 no. No, I don't. I don't want to bring down. I don't. I don't think that uh, Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies will necessarily. Place 
gave currencies. I, but let me go to the first part of your question, which is like, why, I guess I'm dancing around it. Why am I personally passionately interested in Bitcoin? A lot of it has to do with some of the vision I have for the work we're doing with Glyph. So something that I think a lot about are peer to peer transactions. This is where I think things are really exciting. So I gave the Craigslist example as an alt cost to you, not just as a funny thing, but something where I actually feel like there's a really big future in peer to peer transactions. Portland's a great place uh, where, in the sense that it's kind of a small, mining community. Tiny little community where I think we interact more with our neighbors, maybe more than other places in this country, or at least more people would try to. Um, and that by cutting out businesses and working directly with people around us, we can save a lot of value. Uh, things can be reused. Uh, you know, we can avoid having to put money out into places that don't need it. That doesn't need to happen. So I believe a lot in peer-to-peer -peer transactions. Some of the uh, companies I'm really excited about are Airbnb, which we can rent out their extra room. And also Lyft, which is trying to come to Portland with uh, regulation to stop it from doing it. Just you can basically drive the car and give somebody a ride and, uh, to wherever they're going. It be a taxi for three hours a day. And you can still like, see your kids and stuff. You have an extra job, basically. And these are like small examples, but I believe that there's going to be a future where there's a lot of these peer-to-peer -peer exchanges of services and an incredible amount of flourishing of goods being transferred between people. And I think that Bitcoin that actually is a much better method for doing so than, say, cash. Partly because it's so convenient to move and so easy to separate down to small pieces. There's no exact change in Bitcoin. So, um, I think that's like cash is going to be back in the So, when I buy a Bitcoin, where exactly is my cash value? So, it's as in when I purchase something, mm -hmm. that is the cash. So, it, Bitcoin is not directly, um, maybe I didn't describe it too well. She was asking uh, how old is kind of cash related to Bitcoin? I'm not going to be the best person probably to answer this question, but uh, basically the, the Bitcoin is not directly driven by the value of the dollar. It just happens to be that people consider Bitcoin to be worth $200 today. Uh, it's, de it's really decoupled from that. So when you give me cash for Bitcoin, it goes into my pocket and I go spend it on something else and I actually buy from Bitcoin. <laughs> but uh, it does, it's actually completely decoupled. So there's no direct relationship whatsoever between Just as you could buy Bitcoin with euros. After this one, uh, we do have a microphone going around. Okay. So, yeah, so raise your hands again and let's. Yeah. But uh, we'll go ahead and answer this one and then we'll go okay. to the microphone. So he was asking how Bitcoins are created. And I, I, I feel bad since a lot of people are new to Bitcoin, I didn't really do a great job doing the intro. And I would say if you haven't done it, you did, if you are confused or you don't didn't get enough information, I would recommend Khan's Academy and their Bitcoin uh, series on it. They've got six lectures and they're terrific. It's just a guy with a white but to briefly answer your question, yeah, Khan, K H A N, Khan's Academy. They've got a Bitcoin series. Basically, uh, when you participate in the Bitcoin network, so when you're helping Bitcoin move around, you basically are volunteering your computer to say, hey, I'm out here. If uh, Miranda wants to send Bud Bitcoin, I'm here to help. And your computer is just sitting there listening and waiting for you to ask. And then when that, uh, when that transaction is floated out there, hey, internet, please send this Bitcoin to this person. A uh, particular machine may be lucky enough, and it's really about kind of some luck, to be able to perform this block that contains that transaction. And if you're the one to catch this block, it's almost like bingo, you get like 25 Bitcoin, I believe, right now, uh, which is a lot of investment. 25 Bitcoin. It's a, lot, a lot of money. Uh, but it's very, very hard to do that now. In fact, it's so hard, it's called mining, and it's so hard that if you're not already mining, So yeah, it's called mining. That's what it's called. The easiest way now is to buy it. So, next year. Oh, right here. Uh, appreciate your comments. Uh, Bitcoin is interesting, but I appreciate the comment you made about peer-to-peer -peer transactions. So based on that, can you speak about competing um, Bitcoins? Okay. Other currencies? Uh, so there are other ones, as you mentioned, there's some of the big ones. Uh, Litecoin is a derivative of Bitcoin, it's popular to trade right now on the Litecoin. I'm not really into it, that's one. And 
and then uh, there's, a whole, probably there's, a, there's a whole galaxy of other interesting ideas that are not about value. They're about other ways that these uh, virtual currencies can be used. Uh, I, I could go into some of them, this thing called colored coin, where you can basically say a particular physical asset is connected to this particular coin, and when I give you, it's like a title. Like, let's say that I have my title of my car, and I give it to you. Now you have my car, basically. Um, you have the ownership of my car. Electronically, you need something to also designate one particular item to describe this physical thing. You can actually use a currency like Bitcoin or this color coin idea to communicate physical value. It's kind of an advanced idea. It's like, talk about Bitcoin in the stage, that's really early stage. But some of these currencies do that. Um, Ripple is one where they actually they focus very heavily on this peer to peer value exchange. It's very early. Not stuff. Not actually, I don't really understand this kind of this, this concept still. So, um, I even want to shout out other currencies that are big right now, like Ripple. Prime coin. Prime coin. Name coin. Name coin. They merged it with Bitcoin on the blockchain. That's right. Because that's in that new update. Mm -hmm. Any other ones? Just look up virtual currencies. There's a lot of them. There's a bunch. There's a lot. There's a bunch, but uh, you know, start at the top, work your way down. I think Ripple and Litecoin have a good one to look at. Ripple's probably the my understanding is a limit about how much Bitcoin is going to be able to be created, and it seems like that's a problem that's pending, and people are going to start actually using it, and more people are going to be using it. <coughs> What's the thought about that? Is, like, how's it, are, they going to, are they going to change that rule and actually make more, or... What, what do people see as the future if they don't, and also if they don't add more, what, what will happen in the future? That's a really interesting key concept, another one I skipped over, um, is that Bitcoin is the first deflationary currency. So you normally think of US dollars, you can point at and stuff where we're just printing more dollars, pieces of paper, and putting them out for money supply. Bitcoin's release, the 25 Bitcoin I mentioned from the mining, happens on a regular schedule. It does this graph. 2140, so what's that, about 120 something years from now, or thereabouts, where Bitcoin will stop being released into the market and we will have the maximum number of Bitcoins. Anybody know the maximum number of Bitcoins? 21 million. 21 million Bitcoins will ever be available. There's no chairman of the Fed who can change that. It's written into the algorithm that cannot be changed. So the question is uh, is that a problem? Like, would, if, if we know that it's going to become less, then it's going to be worse. Yeah, I'd say it is. I'd say that's actually a problem right now, and that's why it's the value store is kind of a big deal because people are buying the kind of the content. I don't have the answer to that. Uh, I don't know if it's going to ultimately be a real problem if people have to look at other currencies in order to find a way to use it in a transaction. Uh, I don't know. So how hard is it to hack the algorithm? Oh, sorry. Oh, so she asked how hard is it to hack Bitcoin? <laughs> so the algorithm, how it works, and make changes to it. So it's going to be really hard, so hard that no one's figured it out how to do it yet. Bitcoin is a completely open source project at this point. Uh, it's being worked on by a foundation similar to how Linux is being developed. And uh, no one's going to hack it. The more likely uh, hack points that have happened, which have been numerous, have been at the wallets and exchanges themselves. So a lot of wallets have been hacked and a lot of Bitcoin is still um, Make no mistake about it. A lot of um, those ones I mentioned have been done pretty well, but uh, it's, it's like I said, it's that minor guy. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, this may be a uh, bit of a simplistic question, but uh, we're talking about these peer-to-peer -peer transactions and uh, buying stuff with Bitcoin, like brick and mortar stores. Um, does it just work simply that you're just paying with fractions of a Bitcoin for these things rather than, you know? Paying like se severely overpaying for a hand buy with yeah. one Bitcoin. Another <laughs> 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 detail I didn't talk about is Bitcoin goes down to like eight decimal places, so you can actually split a, a Bitcoin down to almost just a shred of nothing, uh, and you can send that. Uh, usually, it's like our app on iOS, we send the minimum you can send is 0.01 Bitcoin, which is like a dollar ninety something today. Um, but our Android version, which is different, you can actually just punch in the amount. But probably an important point to make is that when you get really small, let's say you started sending like 0.0001 Bitcoin, like 
over and over and over again or something. Like, you would kind of be on a chance to do a denial of service attack against the network for like, you know, thousands of a penny. And so Bitcoin actually built in a mechanism to protect against kind of like a hack against it, no kind of version of a hack, uh, which is that you have a minor key that kicks in when you start doing really small transactions. And that basically goes to the person out there with the computer who uh, processes the transaction on your behalf. So there's a lot of, I mean, it's beautiful technology. Problems are kind of like continually being addressed at this time. But uh, you can't split the answer to the You can't split the answer to the Cool. And uh, are you Satoshi Nakamoto? I am not Satoshi Nakamoto. <laughs> <laughs> I would be a Satoshi Nakamoto. Um, you might want to explain that. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, yeah. So I guess this is, like, this is the epic. This is zero kick in the pants. Great. The thing about Bitcoin, okay? Is that uh, no one knows who invented Bitcoin. It's like the uh, Loch Ness Monster invented Bitcoin. <laughs> uh, except for Loch Ness name Satoshi Nakamoto. And we don't know if this is one person, if it's a guy or a girl, or if it's a group of people. There's been a lot of journalistic, uh, journal uh, people trying to try to figure this out. A lot of people try to figure it out. Well, also, who? 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 Are security and cryptography uh, researchers. But they basically what happened was they published a paper on a forum, or actually, an email, email newsletter, is that right? Email thing, and then paper fell away. It's like a four page white paper describing Bitcoin. Out of the and it's totally readable for any of you that are interested. It's not programming language at all, it's very clean cut English algorithms. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. It's really amazing. And then, like, a couple months later, the first version of the software got released. Forum popped up, and then basically after that, this person or people just, just missed. And so now it's like, that's almost what's most beautiful about this currency is there's no one behind it, there's no one to kind of blame or call the task for it. I think your mining uh, analogy is actually really apt. Um, is it fair to say that? Most people who have large amounts of Bitcoin have gotten it entirely through mining, similar to, in essence, oil, as opposed to walking down the street and Bitcoin using that. Uh, the one thing I struggle with is how do you start to build up a whatever, bank account for Bitcoin? The only solution I've been able to find is, is mining, which is intimidating to get into at this point. Yeah. So otherwise, you just have to sell things you own, including cash, in order to get something that fair. Is that right? I, I think that's pretty fair. Uh, Building an application that somehow allows you to shave Bitcoin off the transfers. Building an application that allows you to get massively used and you have a reason for them to give Bitcoin to you. Uh, I think that's a great thing. Because what you can essentially do is you're taking US dollars today uh, on the value that you're know, sitting on. So if you are already in convert, I would you know, trying to get involved with some software that collects your money somehow. But yeah, buying it, there's um, so I think I've got an idea. You could do we got some Bitcoin for that security buzz before on the website did Bitcoin. I mean, you can't be almost entrepreneurial at how you're acquiring it. Uh, it's Don't buy miners. Yeah, I, mining is just not, it's kind of, yeah. Yeah. there's no return on investment right now. But it can be yeah. fun. It's something fun. It's fun, but just as an example, this, uh, the network is 3.4 pen hacks right now, <laughs> which is about 3,400 terabytes, or terahash for the calculations. That's most, most supercomputers on the planet with the Bitcoin network. Yeah. So getting a very small piece of the pie nowadays as opposed to when we started, uh, it was it was a, a thousand people. Right. It's an arms race. Right. It, really, it really is. It's a Bitcoin arms race to see who can claim the most per day. So yeah, this could be a question that I have to ask you after this. Could be, could be really weird, but, um, so I just studied the Khan Academy thing, and that was really interesting because it's the most in-depth about these explanations for the student here right now. But um, essentially, what I'm really looking at is, out of the total 21 million uh, uh, Bitcoins, um, 
you know, there's going to be an unused, you know, probability of uh, hashes that we essentially, uh, you know, uh, figure out via the challenge string and the proof of work string. So with these transaction blocks, um, there's basically all these algorithms that haven't been discovered yet, but eventually will be Bitcoin. Right. So I'm just wondering what's stopping an entrepreneur or a PC, you know, or an angel investor from essentially buying, you know, all the unused Bitcoin that essentially will be Bitcoin and then trading it later. And then with that, uh, large transactions, to my knowledge, have been tapped. I'm not sure. I, don't, I mean, I don't think it's possible to get a hold of a block and keep it from everybody else for your own mining purposes. Um, well, the node, I'm sorry about the nodes. Like, you can basically, you can, just based on probability, get all the nodes that haven't been used yet. Oh, I don't know the answer to that question. Anyway. I actually, not, I'm, I'm not super deep on mining experiments. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, the like probability is 2 to the power of 256. Exactly. So you go ahead and work on that. <laughs> <laughs> That's my question. <laughs> <laughs> you were saying that you can't use credit cards or you shouldn't use credit cards to buy Bitcoins. Can you elaborate on that? Sure. So, a uh, couple of here's a way to be scammed. <laughs> so, um, somebody's like, I'll sell you Bitcoin, just send me the PayPal. <clears throat> so, you send the PayPal and then you start to so you send the PayPal to your box and then they, uh, yeah, they send you the Bitcoin. Yeah, you're going to be the scammer. Yeah. I'm going to be the, the Drew. Okay? Uh, so, uh, I'm going to send you uh, $100 a month. Okay, I'm a scammer, right? Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you send me $100 in PayPal, and then I send you $100 worth of Bitcoin, half Bitcoin. And then you tell PayPal, hey, that was not a real transaction. You ripped me off. People's like, oh, okay, here's your money back. And then the coin's already transferred. So you can't, there's no take back to the Bitcoin. Once you send Bitcoin, it is taken. Similarly with credit cards, you can charge that. So you swipe your card to buy that Bitcoin, and then uh, they do a chargeback against you. And they have a chargeback that happens in my business or something. This is going to reverse on the credit card. But Bitcoin, once it's sent, you can take it back to be a scam um, trying to sell it. <coughs> Don't do it. Similarly, you know, wire all this stuff. Like, um, cash is a great way to buy Bitcoin in person. Local Bitcoin is a great place because you have reputation, so people don't know where else. It's under control. So. Good for selling. Buying that bug in a certain way. Yeah, it's a seller who gets scammed. It depends yeah. on. Like, yeah. Oh, there's a question here, and then I'll get to the next. Hi, um, I'm Kyle. I, I wrote the Bitcoin article in, in Silicon Flores last week. I'm working on a Bitcoin wallet called CoinFunk, actually. Um, I wanted to comment quickly on the security issue um, in terms of uh, Bitcoin wallets being stolen, because um, it's something that I've been working on exclusively for six months. Um, all Every single scenario of Bitcoin being stolen has essentially been uh, server side wallets that have gotten their keys stolen. So, for example, um, if you, uh, you know, the way Bitcoin works is you use the private keys to spend all of the transactions that are sent to addresses, right? If those keys are stored on the server and a hacker breaks into that server, um, they can just take all of the private keys and then use it to spend all of the money that's in the system, right? Um, what? So, not not all Bitcoin wallets are created equal, and the kind of the, the kind of coinage of the, the wording I've been using to try to describe the difference between uh, them is. I call, there are Bitcoin accounts, which are, for example, Coinbase is a, is a Bitcoin account. Um, if you don't actually have the private keys, they manage the private keys for you. A uh, Bitcoin wallet is a situation where you actually control the private keys, where you are given them. Um, and I, I see the analogy as between you owning your money and a bank owning your money, right? When you send, your, when you send money to a bank, um, you don't actually, they don't keep the cash in a special little vault for you, right? They just throw it to a big pool and they give you a number to database and that's that's what your money is, right? So um, what we're doing to solve that problem is we're moving, we're encrypting the private keys and moving them away from servers so that if hackers break into the servers, uh, it's not possible to spend your money. 
Um, and I mean, it's kind of like a weird arms race, right? Because like, you know, for example, what CoinPump does is it does all the encryption on the client side. So the new question, the new problem is, well, you could change the JavaScript code that gets sent to the server, right? Well, if you use uh, offline caching and then sign that code or put it into a Google store or something, now you have signed code that can't be tampered with, right? So it's just kind of this, you know, all, but I, but I, want, to, I want to highlight that all of the server, all of the thefts have been server thefts. Um, so for example, blockchain does not do it that way. They do the encryption on the client side. So um, I'm much more comfortable with that story. And um, if, you know, if you, if you use like a client on your own computer, for example, you won't be exposed to that problem as well. Um, so I just wanted to comment on that quickly. Um, you know, in, in the mid-90s, uh, Unix was so screwed up security-wise that you wouldn't put a single credit card on a Unix machine and expect it to stay there for a couple of weeks. Um, it's just, it's a scary problem now. It's going to get solved. So I just wanted to say that. Yeah, that point comments. That's awesome. So essentially, it's like a, I believe it's like a, run your own point of view. Yeah. So how's the way that works? No, I think you're back by... The Bitcoin Foundation founded me for their quarter two grant. Yeah, so that's terrific. So that's actually new here for Yeah, that's pretty awesome. The Bitcoin development happening like right here. And uh, here is our big articles on mobile, on mobile, mobile floor, mobile floors. Silicon floors. Yeah. Silicon floors. Yeah. Yeah. Great, great choices. <coughs> check, check it out. Um, Bitcoin is created on schedule. Where do they go? Yeah, uh, they go into the hands of the person who caught them. Who was there to catch them. So you say it's hard to do. Yeah. Yeah, it's so hard to do the fact that um, more, and this is getting into mining, and we talked all that just about mining. Basically, there's now there's these things called mining pools. So you contribute processing power to the pool, and if you solve a certain amount of these, you try a certain amount, then it is distributed equally among the people who helped find them there. It's just it's, it's so hard to be the one now that people are banding together in these big wagons and working to all the I would encourage you to just learn up online and you'll it'll, it'll help solve a lot. And I'm not going to do that very well. Okay, so we've got our last two here, you and you, and then we're going to wrap it up. So what happens to Bitcoin if the internet goes down? I don't know. Okay, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess, um, well, one, I guess, Bitcoin, I guess, could Bitcoin work without the internet? That's an interesting question. There's this big blockchain that everybody needs to have a copy of. So I guess theoretically we could all be on Bluetooth. <laughs> <laughs> I think we really are. We like having Bluetooth now. Sure. If the internet goes down, as long as one person has the most recent blockchain downloaded onto their computer, yeah. once the internet comes back up, all the rest of the nodes would automatically accept that as the ledger, public ledger, and then everybody would start kicking. So there's the, once you own Bitcoin and you're in the ledger, you there is yours. There is by the laws of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> so there's no difference if the internet goes down whether you have them on your computer or Right, you don't, yeah, right. You're, the actual Bitcoins exist in the identical block ledger, blockchain, the public ledger that exists on all computers. Right, yeah. Say that that and that's and that, so when you, have, when you have a ledger of, of Bitcoin, you actually have all and my understanding is you have all transactions that right. ever happen. And, and so it keeps getting bigger and bigger. Right, 8.2 gigs right now. Mm. Yeah, you. Yeah, last question? No, final question here. So uh, I just wanted to make one comment real quick. Uh, I believe it was you who asked about the value of Bitcoin and the 21 million coins. Uh, I've been doing Bitcoin since early 2010. I've run several Bitcoin services. I started with the Bitcoin pool those that are up. And uh, my experience has been that it's kind of like a finite resource. If you only have 21 million ounces of gold, and there's no more gold to be found ever in the earth ever in the hypothetical situation of Bitcoin, it's going to make that more scarce. And once that becomes more scarce, more people want it, more valuable it becomes. So the, a lot of people say that the 21 million Bitcoins isn't enough to really feed the whole world Bitcoins. But it can be because it has those decimal <laughs> points out after that. It's not like the US dollar where you stop at a penny. You can divvy it up you know, a lot in that way. So to have something that is going to have a max cap on it is actually historically, in the terms of Bitcoin, proven to make it more valuable as it's become more and more popular. And more people want it, 